Oh man, today's episode was incredible. We interviewed Dave Dahl, he's the creator of Dave's Killer Bread. One of the best stories I've ever heard in my entire life. I love this guy right away. As soon as we started talking, I'm like, this dude gets it. Um, and his story is extremely inspirational. So because I loved it so much, uh, the giveaway today is going to be phenomenal. Here's the giveaway. Today, I'm going to give away access to Maps Powerlift and Maps Strong, two very popular Maps workout programs. Maps Powerlift is a powerlifting workout program. Maps Strong is more of a strongman-inspired workout program. And here's how you can win access, free access to both programs. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all three things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and then we'll give you access to those two programs. Also, there's only 24 hours left for our February sale. So February, we did a 50% off sale MAPS Performance and a 50% off MAPS Aesthetic. Now, MAPS Performance is athletic-minded. So if you like unconventional training, if you like to perform like an athlete and look like an athlete, that's the program. MAPS Aesthetic is a bodybuilder style program. So if you like to build and sculpt your body, develop symmetry, that's the workout for you. So they're still 50% off. There's only 24 hours left for the sale. Here's how you can sign up. If you want MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. Uh, and if you want MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And then the 50% off code for both of them is FEB50. Okay, so again, FEB50 gives you 50% off either MAPS Performance or MAPS Aesthetic. All right, here comes the show. Now, you have a very interesting success story, one of the most interesting that I've ever heard. I'd like to go back and talk a little bit about how that all started. By the way, we're all fans of your product. I've seen it <laughs> oh, yeah. for a long time. I mean, I mean, Love I mean Dave's bread. It, yeah, it's really, really good. In fact, I think uh, Doug, your mom was a huge fan. Yeah, she's yeah. been a fan for years. Yeah, yeah. Doug, Doug was actually telling him out, out in the lobby before you guys came out that I think she was, she's been more excited about him as a guest than any other guest that we've, that's had, awesome. that we've had on the yeah. show. That's yeah, great. that's what kind of impact <laughs> you've had on people. Yeah, let's go back. And uh, how did that all start? How did you come up with the idea? And, and what was the, I guess, the impetus? Well, uh, if you talk about the bread, uh, it took a long time to get to that point. But my dad was a baker and um, a whole grain baker before people even knew what a whole grain was, right? And he was, uh, you know, was into natural foods. And uh, we had a health food store, a little health food store in front of our bakery when I was a kid. Um, so I was introduced to like Hoffman uh, protein um, pills. Uh, yeah. I used to love those. I, that was my that was my thing. So I I developed a real taste for protein supplements. I liked it. I liked the taste of them, you know, as well as man. The, even the ones back then, those were oh, they were good. I mean, <laughs> they he knew what he was doing. This Hoffman guy he was one of those. He's a pioneer. Yeah, you know where he is. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He, way back in the day. Did you ever take the Beverly protein supplements and all that stuff too? Oh, or? I don't know about that. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that, but I remember the Hoffman, the big thing and. <laughs> <laughs> trying it open and good deal busy. yeah where was this where'd you where'd you, where'd you grow up uh, i grew up in gresham oregon which is uh 12 miles outside of portland okay. it's a suburb okay so that's where you kind of got your roots in the, in the baking but you didn't decide to start the business then right that was a little later uh no not at all uh my dad had the business had the bakery and so we grew up working our asses off in the bakery uh but was for next to nothing. Nobody had any money, you know. No, if we didn't have money, if people are, you got a business, that's what all my so-called friends used to think. But oh, you got a business, so uh, you must be rich. But it was the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> we we survived. My dad worked very hard to make, to, and so did we to make it work. Uh, so that was that, and um, and my dad was ahead of his time as far as mm. the product. You know, nobody cared except hippies. Yeah, days. it was like unheard of back then. Was this the 50s or 60s where he first started? It was the 60s where okay. he got started. It was the 70s by the time I was getting into it. And, um, you know, my dad hated hippies. He was a Nixon guy. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> but he, this is pretty ironic. Yeah, it's all into everything, organic, right? everything about my story and my dad, everything, all that is ironic. You know, I hated my dad growing up. Uh, until I realized uh, how hard it is to live and <laughs> grow up and be a man. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it wasn't until he was dead that I, I realized he was a pretty cool dude in his own way. So um, anyway, I went to, I grew up and, and I was a lost soul early on. Um, I went to Seventh-day Adventist school, so uh, 
You know, it was like every day was the Bible and every weekend mm -hmm. was the Bible. And, uh, and eventually I, um, I rebelled against that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who I was, but I knew I wasn't that. And so I went out in my teenage years and started getting into one scrape after another. Um, a lot of, you know, weird stuff that's probably not worth even mentioning, but there's just lots of things that happened. And eventually I went to prison. Uh, I became a meth addict. I loved meth. First transformation in my life was a needle full of methamphetamine in my arm. And um, Did you first use it in prison or was this before you went? Before, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the reason I went to prison. Oh, okay. But, you know, at first it was like... Um, you know, you, there's things in your life that feel like an epiphany. That was my first epiphany. And I just, you know, I thought, well, everything's going to be cool from now on. Uh, I know what's up. But I just went out and became a criminal to support my habit. And uh, went to prison four times. Went, um, I got lots of stories. <laughs> but, uh, I mean... How old were you the first time you went? Died a couple How times. old were you the first time you went in? Uh, I was in my mid twenties. Mid twenties, yeah. And it was I was related. a late bloomer. And was were you? <laughs> <laughs> was it were were you were you carrying? Were you distributing? What what caught what caught you the first time? Well, the first time was burglary, okay. and I was just an inept burglar. Uh, but it got me by for a while until I went to prison, and so I, that I actually look at every time I went to prison as sort of a good thing looking back and it, it, how it taught me a lot of things over over time and it, it, i needed it you know um were there so, each each time you went in were there like pivotal things that you remember learning like the first time like this was the lesson i learned the second yeah. time i learned can you well the first time okay the first three times i was trying to be a better criminal <laughs> yeah. so yeah which is this That's is common this is what you hear a lot yeah. right a lot of times people say that they go in and they just learn it's how like to be school. a better how can i not get caught that's what you're yeah. thinking you know and you know you start looking you look up all to all the gangster types and all that stuff and you know i eventually realized on my fourth trip to prison i finally was like okay this isn't working this is not uh this is not what i'm meant to do <laughs> Uh, in fact, I I was suicidal, and um, you know I don't know how I made it through a few years of that last sentence, but I had my second epiphany, my second transformation began uh, due to enough struggle, enough uh, adversity, eventually um, bringing about a change, and and the change was I asked for help, um, which you, it's not something you. You, you associate with prison, right? Mm. So, um, it Who'd took you me, ask? I, I asked, I, I put in a kite. It took me a long, a kite is an inmate communication form too. Oh, okay. And I, I put this kite in, but it, I wrote it like several times before I actually put it in. <laughs> uh, because I didn't, I never could quite, I look at it as, uh, courage now and humility that it took and, and just, it was just a moment of clarity where I realized I didn't have to be anything but who I am. Um, I'm okay with who I am just right now, no matter what happens today, um, I'm going to make the most of it. And from that point on, it's very simple, but it was humility in the sense that I am no more and no less than I need to be. You know, I can, and the, the problem always was I would pretend to be more and, you know, harder and tougher and, you know, all that uh, to get by. And inside I was a quivering jelly-like mass. And I eventually um, realized I didn't have to be either one of those. I'm just going to be me and I'm going to apply myself to the next opportunity. And this... Um, now this this was this something that just like came to you and you're like I got to do this I got to write that and then who do you write this to you said it's like a way to communicate in prison who does this end up going to or was it an anonymous well I didn't know who it was but I knew um, I I knew it was psych services they oh, had psychiatric okay. services but it, the person who prescribed me medication um, was not a psychiatrist they were a nurse. Uh, physician's assistant so they were able to prescribe anything pretty much and he gave me this med and i was never diagnosed with anything 
but I told him my, my situation. I didn't say I was suicidal because that'd be like suicidal. Mm -hmm. You don't tell him that. But uh, I told him I had some issues and um, he said, well, you want to try this medication? And, and I did. It was Paxil. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much of my transformation began with that moment of putting the kite in and that humility and that kind of like new new courage mm. uh or how much was the medication and then about a month later i, I had been on a list for computer aided drafting which it was cad cam they called it and i was like uh i don't have any idea what that is but i'm on the list for it and i'd been on the list for three years and it came up right after this sort of beginning of, of a transformation I was having and it was the perfect time because I didn't even know how to turn on the computer when I got in there but w within a short time I was passing everybody else up because I was ex I was excited about it I was and I realized all of a sudden that I'm not dumb you know mm. just because I've done a lot of dumb things doesn't mean I'm not capable of doing other things now I've heard you on a few other like interviews and uh, during this part of your transformation was building yourself and growing physically part of that. Would, did you get into training a lot and in how prison. did you spend your time a lot of, you know, besides, you know, the drafting in, in prison? That's a good one. Um, I always, when I, every time I went down, went to prison, I had some sort of training that I was doing in those days. A lot of it was, it was always, there was the, the weights and, you know, depending on where you were at, sometimes the weights were better than other way, other places, mm -hmm. you know, and you had better opportunities and more time to do it, say, than somewhere else. Um, it was all, I was in so many different locations in prison that it was like going from gym to gym, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, uh, I finally, uh, but one thing that I always did was I ran, I would run the track and it kept me lean uh but i also had a pretty good physique you know so uh those were the good old days <laughs> i uh it was before all the other things that at as age has kind of brought me to a different point where i have to do like like you said i have to modify my training to fit what i'm capable of doing um but in those days yeah there was training running um i was Definitely one of the best physiques on the yard. Not the biggest, but one of the best physiques. How so. do you feel? I would love to ask someone like you this question because a, a while ago there was this controversy around uh, weights in prisons. And I know here in California they removed them because they said, oh, we don't want the inmates weapons to get too big and strong or use oh, them as weapons. Now, for someone who understands the the positives that just and how empowering it is to, to improve your, your health and your fitness – and not just that, but also have something you could take away if, so people look forward to it and say, okay, I, I want to be a particular way in prison so I can work out. I thought it was a terrible idea. I agree. Do you agree with that? Do, do you see it as a positive? Well, this is the way I look at that. Uh, I haven't heard that particular question asked, although when I look at, you know, when they say take it away, you know, take it away, that's not, that's not the way to do it. Um, okay, maybe you build yourself, maybe you prove yourself on another you know, accountability uh, mm -hmm. line. You go, um, I am, maybe I'm just doing push-ups now because they're not going to let me use the weights. Maybe I'm doing that, you know. Maybe I'm walking around a, a pillar and I'm doing a push-up and, and a pillar again, two push-ups. So it gets to 21 to just see how many people make it through that, right? It's uh, That was the kind of stuff we used to do. Um, we do whatever we had to do, but later on, uh, but I was always like bummed out when they started taking the weights and making them more restrictive and less time to use them. And um, I just think that everything should be given to people when they're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would did, agree. Each time you went in, um, was it? Did it get easier for you to serve the time, or do you have like a moment that was like one of the scariest times in in prison? And was that the first, the second, the third, fourth, like? There were some scary times. Uh, I mean, there were some fights and stuff, but, and and things that, you know, when you end up going to the hole, that's that sucks. <laughs> that's, it's more about that solitary confinement. Yeah. Okay. It's more about being able to take. Being it's more about your opportunities, and when and like when you're working hard and you you find something that you can you can get into that helps your time go by, and and you know you're getting better as a person. 
when you can do that, um, it, it kind of, it, it's totally different than, you know, what would happen to me, what was really bad in the first few years of my last sentence when I really had this moment of clarity about how bad things were. I mean, you, it, you couldn't, there's no way you could say that things weren't really, really bad. Mm. And, uh, but the worst thing was my mind was that I was happening to my situations. And I was, I was, I had not learned at that point in the early, you know, the first three times I went to prison and the half of the second, fourth time, I had not yet learned that your mind is everything. You know, it, it all starts right, right in your mind. And you can control, you can uh, create your future. Mm. You guys know that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that. I, I didn't understand that easy thing you know it's it's simple but not easy right simple, simple but then simple. making that change easy to understand yeah mm -hmm. were you would you say that's the biggest difference between you and and other people who've gone through those those experiences because here you are uh for for a little while there career cr criminal come out and you create and we'll get into this mm -hmm. an extremely successful business like talk about a complete reversal yeah. but you're such a small percentage of people that end up going through those problems would you what would you say is the big difference between you and them was it that realization that hey i have this ability to change my life would you say that's i think uh i got lucky in the sense that things happened when i needed them to yeah. i don't know that everybody is looking for that the ones who are looking for that and are open and find the courage and the humility to do it which is the big challenge guys in there you know people in general but those guys in prison are used to instant gratification i get i go out and do a burglary i have what i want i do a you know um i slap somebody around take their stuff uh that's instant gratification mm. you know you're not going to get that in the real world uh in the world that we live in or that i live in now so you have to adjust to you have to actually learn to appreciate the process that was a big factor for me like you when you're lifting weights uh you you, you got to appreciate what you're doing at the time you're yeah. like oh i'm gonna feel great and you know, it's 10 years when I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so true yeah you, you ain't, gotta, you ain't gotta, gonna build big muscles right now that's gonna take a while yeah, yeah. and you gotta you gotta love yourself you gotta be accepting um of what you are capable of i uh being a guy who uh, appreciates some of the uh, aspects of alcoholics anonymous and such there's one uh, thing that we all, it's the serenity prayer. It's God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful wisdom profound, to me. Yeah. And I, I always am thinking about that. What, what do you what do you think was the most pivotal thing then for you did you did you read something did someone speak something to you I mean what made you transition then from the career criminal and heading down the wrong path to all of a sudden okay I'm gonna change I'm gonna change this is no longer me well there's this this period of time before the, that that happens where you're kind of just lost and you you're getting like little hints of things that might 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 that you might be able to do and stuff but you're it, as long as you have as long as i had that that sense of you know low uh self-esteem uh low self-worth i as long as i was feeling that way and i wasn't able to overcome that i couldn't i would hear all these things about self-improvement self-help and all this stuff. i would read that kind of stuff it just didn't stick you knew it was right but it didn't stick until i had that moment of like well, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be this road that you're going to go down and and you're going to go this way and go that way and you're going to struggle. But now I was like, I am going to enjoy the struggle. Mm -hmm. I'm going to learn. Wow. And the rest of my life from that point on, even though I've had some doozies since then, have been I've been able to, to deal with it, mm. you know, and overcome it, knowing that, even sometimes when I physically couldn't see that I could overcome something, I knew from my past, I knew inside up here that I could do it because I'd done it before. I just didn't, sometimes I didn't know how, but you figure it out. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so at what point did you decide, uh, I'm going to start a business? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, 
my well, before dad, we get into that, I know you brought up um, drafting a bit yeah. and how that inspired you oh, quite a bit. Like, what what is it particularly uh, that that you learned uh, from that, and then were able to kind of take that momentum with you back to the real world? Well, outside, you know me. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a big deal. Another big part of the transformation was um, was applying myself to what I was able to was given the opportunity to learn and for some reason drafting just fit the bill uh I began to um draw plans I I would that guitar for instance um it's one of the first things I tried to draw in in, in there you know it, pretty complicated there's a lot of things to think about when you make that mm -hmm. and it's a lot of fun you know, because you, and what you do is you just, you start with a piece or anything um, that already exists. You learn how to replicate it. Not easy. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's not. You know, it's easier than, but you work, say you work with somebody who has a vision for what they want. That's, you know, that could be, or you know it yourself, where you, you, you begin with the idea or the end in mind. And then you start working toward that end, but you have to start with something that already exists, like this can. And but you, but you want this can to have wings, you know. If that's the case, you got to design the wings, but you have to learn the can first. And um, I did that with lots of things in prison, and I got cut short because they put me in a drug program. I just, oh man! Mm. But it got me out two years early on a almost ten year sentence. So the point is, uh, to your point. Justin, right? Yeah. Um, it was, it was, you know, people go, how does that apply to making bread? Well, it applies to everything. That mindset, your body, your body, your body, you guys obviously have used those principles, designing your body, uh, designing your, um, your routines and all the different things that you do in your life. Uh, that's what I, I, I just, I just really internalized that process and I took it on to, to bread. Mm -hmm. My brother, the reason why I chose bread rather than say going to work for somebody else, which was what I had, had intended to do. Uh, my brother was running my fam my dad's bakery mm -hmm. and my brother's like eight years older than me. And anyway, I did not want to go back to the family. It was just like the bridge was I did not see that bridge uh, anymore. I didn't want to go back. Um, but I, I, all of a sudden, <clears throat> I started dreaming. Excuse me. I started dreaming um, about the bakery. Mm. It was weird. Like literally having dreams? Yeah. Oh, wow. They were nightmares. Because <laughs> everything I yeah, can remember. Yeah, you didn't enjoy it, right? Yeah, I was like, I, why would I want to go back to this? Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. weird. Yeah, because I had, oh, I guess lots of stories. But uh, you would think bakery or... What's the big deal, right? But it is kind of in its own way. And um, anyway, so my brother gave me the chance. He kind of has always known that I was I was a little bit creative. I just never replied it right. Hmm. I get out there, and the first thing I did for my brother, it was like a few days out of, of prison. It was early 2005, very early. And uh, I just went to work filling in for people that didn't make it and it was happening all the time it wasn't long till I was 40 hours 50 hours a week and I started envisioning how I was going to make these products and I told my brother look I'm going to work 100 hours a week you know mm. maybe you know whatever a lot of hours and you're not going to want to pay me by the hour <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. that was, but <laughs> you would have made more. <laughs> it turned out all right, though. Uh, I I made this bread. Uh, first, it was like cookies. He wanted me to update the cookies that, that we made uh, for Trader Joe's. He wanted to make them healthier. So I, designed, I just replaced ingredients, and I even added a, a new variety and... Um, did, now, did you at this point did you realize you had a talent for this? Were you like, hey, I'm, I'm yeah? And this. also, are you? I could see my way to the end product. It was like it, it wasn't even about me. It was about the, the process. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and you had it, this talent, and you didn't even know. It was a natural. It was like breathing to me. You know, it still is. I would I would love to be back there doing it. I mean, were you having to uh, to? I mean, because. <laughs> 
you just said that like it was so easy, but it's like for I couldn't I couldn't bake if my life depended on it. And I so couldn't be as big as you. Probably. Well, how, how did you know? How did you know? Uh, <laughs> what, in, what ingredients? What, thank, you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dave. That's the prison what, talking. What, what, what ingredients? <laughs> you, what, wanna, you what, don't want to hear that. Prison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little nervous over here. <laughs> now, <so. laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know what ingredients to put with what to make it taste a certain way or to, quote unquote, make it healthier. So were you reading and studying about this beforehand or did you literally just just take a shot at it and start knowing what you're doing? Well, I warmed up with the cookies. They were fairly simple. The cookies are simpler than than um, bread. Bread is a much more complex sort of uh, process and everything that, that goes, the science into it is really challenging. Um so I did the cookies, and then uh, I guess I mean, what it was is I was really just getting going. I'm like, okay, I got 20 more kinds of cookies I'm going to make. And my brother goes, we don't really make cookies. We make bread. You see that See that? Uh, that line over the bread line over there? That's, mm-hmm. I want you to fill that up. Because <laughs> he had been working all those years on creating something, even though everything was some old contraption, right, that he managed to make work. Uh, cause nobody had, nobody had real money. So, um, now did he identify the talent? He was like, Hey man, you're kind of good yeah, at this. And yeah, how was bread. it that he gave well, you he a chance it. coming out of prison? Cause we, yeah. I, I would think that like, depending on your guys' relationship, like, uh, was he worried at all that like, you oh, were yeah. going to take it seriously? No, he was worried that I would fuck up again because that's, mm. that was the his, my history. But he also saw that something had changed in me. Mm. So he was, uh, it was in a good place, you know, with it. Um, but there was that, the, the past always is there, you know. So, uh, plus I was very high strung. You know, I was just like moving really fast and making everybody uncomfortable because I'm just, I'm just doing this. All of a sudden I'm making new products. Nobody wants a bunch of stuff that's going to make them have to work harder or whatever, <laughs> you know. So nobody really saw. So what it was, uh, to, to your question, it was like, um, it was easy in the same way that drafting was easy. So you, because I knew the process, I knew that I didn't think I was going to be a millionaire. What I knew and what, and thought is that I would be, um, make us make a successful products. So I would, I would improve the, the family's standing in the community or in the business mm-hmm. and the community. And I, I just, that's how I saw it. I didn't have huge dreams about it. I was like, incremental um and i but the thing was it was the summer of the year that i got out so it was eight months after i got out that i was able to take four varieties i had six ready to go but we said let's just do four of bread to the farmer's market things just kind of fell into a place again this is one of those beautiful things that happens that that happened with dave's killer bread i i they had something at the farmer's market called the Summer Loaf. It was a bread festival, bread fair, where all these artisan bakers around town could bring their little products. It was great, you know? I mean, but they didn't have it before or since, but mm. they had it that year. Oh, are, you so com- are you competitive? Wow. Do you have a competitive uh, streak? Are you competitive? Oh, well, I, I, it's not that I'm... I just, I, I strive. I strive, you know? And I don't hold myself like... Like I would hate to be in the workout, have to work out with you guys. You know, I couldn't. I knew I oh, couldn't compete, fine. so it'd be like there's, there's no compet, there's no competition yeah. there. It's more like, wow, you guys, okay, I can learn something. though. Mm-hmm. I can learn something. That's that humility well, coming in again, right there. Yeah, yeah. it's so important. Well, humility makes it possible to learn. Yeah, that's, absolutely. Yeah. Well, right now you're teaching right now, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm re- re- being, uh, you know, I'm looking at revisiting a lot of things, and that's that's always good. Hmm. So the the company itself was there's a different name for the bread that your brother was yeah. was creating and making, and what what led Nature to the bake. decision of of it sort of being becoming Dave's Killer Bread? Like, yeah. uh, how did that come about? Everybody regretted that. Which, by the way, that's smart. I think that was smart <laughs> yeah. marketing. You know, it's funny, but it's all natural. It's like when people, some when you when you try too hard to. Uh, to be able to market something, mm. it's different than when it comes natural like that. Well, you th- they think, well, it's genius marketing. Well, okay, you go to prison for 15 years and for, you know, four times for 15 years and almost die and get beat up by the cops and well, all the different things. And, and 
uh, and then get out and do your thing, and you'll have the same kind of marketing opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it's a blueprint right there. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, I did, I understood marketing in the very simplest ways, uh, terms that um, if you, you know, you, you got to create what somebody wants. Now, the thing is, and there's certain features and benefits that you look for, that you want to put in your product, right? Um, and I, I thought that I could go and do surveys and find out what people wanted. But to a degree, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact is people don't really know what they want. They know they want a healthy product. They know they want, you know, this, this, and this, and this. But they don't, they could never tell me how to make, they could never say, oh, I want that bread. Yeah, Did you read about business and stuff, or were you just thinking this? Well, I, I think there's a certain amount of it that, that comes from growing up in the family. Yeah. That was, we were knuckleheads, but. There's a famous quote from, I think it was Henry Ford. He said, if I had done, given people what they want, I would have built a better horse carriage. Right. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. That's exact. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I never heard that quote, but that's perfect. I was, um, I was like that. I, I, I wanted to give, do surveys. I wanted to build this product thinking, using all the scientific, you know, means at my disposal. But there was no bread. There was no book that talked out about how to make killer bread. Mm -hmm. if, I, if you follow the, science in the books uh you'll never make that bread mm. you just won't do it oh, your, your mind's going here your mind's going there but you won't make that you'll make the bread that's already out there right you know? right so, so you make you make some of this and you bring it to this fair or whatever yeah and cr it crushes they went crazy people went nuts and it was just perfect right it's yeah. perfect market timing is beautiful right test marketing if you can test market a product how great you know if you can without spending a lot of money you know we worked really hard uh, but we had we maybe we you wouldn't believe the kind of budget we had we didn't have one and uh it was my my nephew and myself it was our project and we were at each other's throats from the very beginning and that never ended but hmm. uh we were we managed to get by because we had a common goal in a sense. And uh, we would take the product to the market and people would freak out and go, well, wait, the farmer's market's going to end. Where am I going to get this now? Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> tell your, tell your, uh, tell your store that you go to, tell the manager that you need this bread and tell your friends to tell them and so forth. That's, that was how we got the word out. I was getting news write-ups, media stuff. Wow! Within all months. from the farmers market. Yeah, within months. Wow. And then it just it just cascaded. I mean, you would not believe the 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 swell of attention I got in those days. What and year is this? What year is this? Two thousand five was kind okay. of the beginning of it. Two thousand six was really starting to, and it, you know what I mean. Each year it was like growing by double, triple, quadruple. At what point were you like, this is crazy. I'm going to be making a lot of money. I I couldn't imagine making that much money because the, the margin was so low. Sure. and uh, You have it, to sell a lot of bread. Yeah. and But we could see, so here was, there was one thing. Okay, let's skip to, say, 2007, and Costco is saying, hey, uh, my customers keep saying they want your bread, right? And... And I'm like, we're in this little place, you know, we're 15,000 square foot place, which is pretty small for what we're trying to do. And um, we couldn't afford to go down for a day. We couldn't afford to move. Uh, our our business uh, bank was, it was 2000, now it was getting to be 2008 by this time, right? Mm. By the time that we, I started really thinking about trying to pursue this idea of Costco. And we knew that we were going to have to move to a much bigger facility. We're going to have to buy all these, all this equipment, all these things we were going to have to do. And we're just three, three hillbillies. That's gotta be scary. That's gotta be scary <laughs> right. as hell, right? Exciting, but scary. Exciting, but scaling now. But yeah, scary as hell. Scary because you don't lot. know. Yeah. You don't know. You don't even know. Cause you, first of all, it's, a, it's 2008 downturn in the economy. Yeah. I didn't see it because the product just kept going, 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 going. Nobody, nobody cared. You know, it was the most expensive bread out there, but 
Mm-hmm. It was a lot, you know, they weren't going to buy their boats and their, you know, toys, but they were going to buy their bread. Mm-hmm. That's what I found out. So it was the Cadillac of bread. So anyway, that was, it was something that we had to do and we never took a break on, on making bread. We were making it in two places for a day or two. And, but we finally were able to get a loan through someone who was willing to take a chance on, on a startup, kind of a startup company in a sense in that way. Uh, even though we've been around for 50 some years, uh, it was a new, it was a new line within, um, an old company. And so that was the answer, the long answer mm-hmm. to what you said, which was, uh, why did you start a business? Or, you know, yeah. how did that come about? Yeah. I didn't actually start one, and I wouldn't have chosen to start one. I would have been happy to go to work for somebody and just kick ass and just be the best employee they ever, they ever had. You know what's interesting about this is that going through what you went through, a lot of people, most people, I think, would look back and say, man, uh, Life uh, dealt me a lot of challenging hands. I'm unlucky. I'm, it's just yeah. life sucks. Victimhood. This is what happened to me. Yeah. And look at my circumstances. I'm a victim. But you've said something now several times, which I find is interesting, where you say, oh, it, it was just perfect timing. Things worked out. You have, the, you have this ability to look at your circumstances, focus on the positive opportunities that seem to pop up for you and you, you make it sound like it's chance or this is what happened. I was lucky. You make you your could, own luck. <laughs> you, I was just, you could totally go in the opposite direction and say yeah. how unlucky you are and how terrible things were. And you wouldn't be here. You know, I have you plenty did. of, plenty of things that trip me up over time. So yes, you know, cause you think you got it figured out, right? I mean, I'm just to carry that a little further. You it's say 2008 again, kind of an important year. Um, I was, I was writing my story down and putting it online. I mean, we finally had, it was before Facebook. So it was, we had my, I had MySpace and I had, uh, um, and then we were able to develop a website in-house. My, my nephew was tech savvy enough to do it. So we, we, we had a little uh, Dave's Killer Bread website and we had a lot of fun with it. Like we always had fun with things in those days. Um, but it, these were, things that were you know slowly but surely happening but i was i was writing my story down and people were like because everybody cause, okay originally on the back of the bag the common sense thing was to me was i had to tell people who i am because my brother he asked how it became dave's killer bread my brother wanted to call my bread dave's bread which was really a dumb move on his part (laughs) because he didn't know how much he's like, well, Dave's so humble. It won't go to his head. (laughs) Little did he know. He didn't think that, believe me. But uh, so anyway, and the whole idea was that we talked to this copyright attorney and he was like, because we knew we had a good product. People were responding very well. Uh, And the copyright attorney says, um, you know, it's a great product. I love your product, but you got to come up with some packaging stuff. You got to you gotta come up with a logo. And here I am, like, it's always this challenge. It's like, okay, I could be like, I'm defeated. I got to go find somebody to do this. Mm-hmm. Instead, I just did it, right? The guy, uh, I'm sitting across from him, and I'm drawing up this idea. And I, I draw this big guy. Well, it wasn't even big, you know, but bigger bigger than me and it just i mean it, it wasn't about how big he was really it was just i was trying to be kind of not me but me you know mm-hmm. and drawing this guy with his guitar with his guitar painted on a brick wall say in an alley and the the guitar <laughs> the guitar went up through the v and it still does in the logo but uh then somebody comes along with a can of red spray paint and tags killer on top of it. And no, you would never get that from looking at the logo now because that's what ended up happening. Mm-hmm. But my original idea was that. And then also the story. God, I can't get me to shut up, man. That story. <laughs> that's perfect. You want to podcast? <laughs> I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you guys. That's the idea, bro. You guys are so yeah, good at talking. Shut up. <laughs> so uh, I've watched plenty of your stuff. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I've learned quite a few things. Um, 
But I knew if we're going to have Dave's bread, we're going to have to tell people who this guy Dave is, right? Oh, there you are. Yeah. That's a really clever way to do that, though, with the whole spray paint idea like that. That's yeah. really clever. Yeah, it looks a lot. I mean, that's well, obviously you, man. Someday, uh, yeah. yeah. Where's that well, stash, though? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, though. I got, I got stories about this. I'm, I'm going to say, okay, the one important part is I had to put my, my story on the back. It's not the same story you see now because now it's d diluted and, you know, it isn't really about me anymore. So, um, but the original story was I was a four-time loser before I realized I was in the wrong game. And that's what started it. And then I, I just talk about the, my transformation in prison and how I ended up making bread. Mm. And people loved it so much that they wanted me to, you know, do all these things. Like, uh, um, they wanted me to speak to all these different groups. So I started doing the Rotary Club circuit in 2009. <laughs> Did every Rotary Club because they all, once you do one, you got to do them all. <laughs> and then, but it was, it's just exposure and exposure and exposure. And it just promoted the bread. It promoted a good idea and a good, you know, good community vibe. And... Then all the employees that I hired that were ex-felons and mm. all that stuff was natural. It wasn't like, let's do a marketing, let's do this marketing move. No, it wasn't like that. It was like, makes sense. Yeah. These are some good guys. Some of these are some good people. Yeah. You got to pick the how, right one. How could you have imagined going through that period before, obviously, the success here? How could you imagine that I was getting you ready for this? You know what I mean? You're going through shit. And the whole time, obviously looking back, you're like, that was getting me ready to do this. Yeah. In fact, uh, we talk about the dreams in prison and stuff. I used to have nightmares where I'd wake up sweating and just go, wow, I'm okay. I'm going to get out. I got like five more years, but at least I still have a chance because in the, in, in, the, uh, in the dreams, I like killed somebody, you know, <laughs> Which I've never done, by the way. That's yeah. that's just a rumor. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. Your, your bread says killer on it. Oh my god, you wouldn't believe people, the people. Uh, yeah, it's a wonder bread people. <laughs> 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 it's so. It's, I got so many funny stories about that. But uh, yeah, it, <laughs> what was I? <laughs> Yeah, well, I want to hear. I want to hear about because you you just went over it real quick. But this is a, one of the coolest parts I think about your story is that the um, your people you employ. Yeah. Yeah. So put your mic down just a little bit too, Dave. That way I can see yeah, your face. There yeah. You go. So yeah. So tell me about. What, okay. First of all, let's let's talk about in 08, 09, This thing really starts taking off. You obviously are scaling up. You guys are probably getting into a bigger facility, mm -hmm. and now you're probably having to take on employees or yeah. hire a bunch of people. What gives you your idea to go the direction you go, and like how does that play out? Tell me. Okay, you're talking about maybe the direction of, of hiring next fellows. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was natural for me because of my my experience my own personal experience having seen the transformation that took place in me i wanted to be a part of other people's transform transformations and also be uh benefited from a business perspective by uh, by those guys by those people because they can be some amazing amazing people they just like they're grateful they're you know the right once once the transformation begins the humility and the gratitude and gratefulness all the different aspects of life when they become positive people and they're they're making a difference in their community uh, because instead of being a bad pole on society they are a you know a push for for better things to happen so but you know i i, I just knew that i had to pass this on this knowledge so so without really going and and you know i wouldn't write a book about it at that point but i uh I remember when we were like 30 employees, right? And then um, it comes along and we need to hire. Within a, several months, we had to hire uh, another 70 or 80. Oh. Yeah. So we're using temp agencies to do this because uh, they do kind of the, some of the homework and so forth. And if it didn't work out, they're gone, you know? Uh so, but what what was funny is once they realized we were hiring, we were willing to hire felons, they, the temp agency sent over nothing but felons. 
And that was never what I wanted to do. Well, yeah, because most places don't. They won't hire felons. Yeah. yeah. So they thought, wow, this is bonanza for our felons who are make up a lot of the, the list of people that need work. So were you the guy who sat down and got to interview each of these felons? Because I would imagine you probably have the best pulse on if this right. guy's really I, reformed or not. I couldn't see, but at this at this point, I couldn't. I could only try to instill the philosophy and the mentality okay. that we're looking for. Uh, but they were just sending those guys over, and I was like, once I realized they were doing that, I said, "You can't do this. I want to pick the best person. I don't care if yeah. they're felons. I don't care what. Uh, I just want the best person." And and to me, again, it's that accountability thing. It's always it's it's not a uh, buzz phrase it's not po political uh, you know I hate politics so uh, I I wasn't even aware of politics until the last few years and it <laughs> drives me nuts so uh, I was happy when I was blissfully ignorant and just cause driven so I did that with these guys and we, and we just hired and they they were very successful you know it, not all of them. Some of them were big jackasses, mm -hmm. but you get that no matter what. Mm -hmm. When you're hiring that many people so fast, I mm -hmm. bet I I bet you they. Uh, well, two things. One, you said something about them being very hard workers because they have another chance, another opportunity. Uh, I have I have experience with that um, managing gyms, and it's true. When when somebody feels like you've given them a chance and they're honest about it and they really appreciate it, you'll find nobody that's more loyal and hardworking. Um, so I'm glad you said that because I do think that that's an important thing for uh, people to hear. But I also imagine that they probably looked up to you because you were like them, but now you're successful. You're the boss. Yeah, and I and my job was to maintain humility and to to maintain being the person who got to this point, uh, and but but better if possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was always a struggle, and you know. I mean, I used to have parties, but I was drinking by this time, you know, um, drinking like a fish. Not really. I mean, I would drink a lot when I drank, but I wasn't really like, I, I ended up getting a lot worse. And uh, I would have people over in my place. You know, I had a pool and we had a lot of fun with all the guys mm -hmm. that, that worked for me. It was that, we were like that. I wasn't a good example at that point when it comes to drinking. Um, but... You know, it was it was a lot of fun, and uh, I, I was no better or worse than any of these guys. You know, that was what the deal was. And um, it was many years before I actually had enough money for a down payment for my house, that house. So, uh, but, but then when it got when I started making money, mm. it started really happening. Costco was what was the big mm. big moment. Yeah, Dude, what, I wanted what, to talk to you about that in terms of that big shift of like now all of a sudden you're successful and yeah. uh, you know and obviously you you have financial means to uh, like how did that look in terms of like how did you how did you adjust and was that a really hard transition for you? Excellent uh, question and complicated. Uh, <laughs> I really was successful before Dave's Killer Bread ever happened. See, this was the thing. That oh, needed, I see. This is the thing that needed to change. Once I was able to get successful in my mind, which wasn't necessarily, okay, I'm going to be rich, I'm going to drive this car, I'm going to have it, whatever. It wasn't that. It To me, success was purpose and, you know, real purpose and understanding, the, you know, how I can be uh, meaningful and how I can have a meaningful life. Uh, once I realized that I was successful, the, the challenge after that, working as hard as I was toward a goal of just constantly getting more bread in people's mouths, you know, <laughs> once, once I realized, okay, once I got that, that goal, um, you never get to the end of that, right? You're always working towards something. And I loved the process. Uh, again, it was the process and learning to appreciate that, uh, how you get there. Um, makes it cool because you never have to arrive. You're already there. Yeah, yeah, love that. <laughs> you know, it's like it, when you, you guys were skinny guys at one point, probably. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. but Not you Justin. All, Justin was fat. Yeah, I was, like, <laughs> I was always a big kid. <laughs> <laughs> but you're always arriving somewhere. But in the meantime, you know, to another level. Yeah. Or whatever. But you're always. But you have to be accepting that. Well, this is where I'm at now. That's where I am at right now. Like like this right now. I but. I'm way better than I was three months ago. 
So I just got to accept that I'm just, I'm on my way. Yeah, you're not doing so, too bad. So, the, the, <laughs> so the, bad. the wave of success comes in. You didn't go run out and buy yourself a Lambo? No. You just have a bunch of, you know. <laughs> That's called high siding, we call it. You know, in prison, we used to call it high siding. When you when you live above your means. Okay. And mm-hmm. you show off. And oh, so you actually about. learned some of this in, in prison. I did. Okay. Yeah. Because the guys who the guys who had a little bit more going on understood that, um, you know, paper tiger kind of thing and it, and so guys would get out guys I knew they'd come to work for me and stuff and they were hard workers and everything but they always so many of them had a high side mentality yeah. I gotta have this car well no you're not gonna have that car right now you're not gonna have that girl right now you know and if you do she'll ruin your life <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's that humility was what's missing in so many of these guys. Humility and, you know, just being, uh, not being, um, not having to have it right now. Did well, that's ever- that's crazy when you think, okay, so, I mean, we're just kind of flying over this, but that's such an important piece that you piece that together while in prison because I- I've seen people, forget your background, I've seen uh, athletes and people that have a huge rise in success financially and they just don't know how to manage their money because mm-hmm. they get so excited because they had nothing and now they have so much and they yeah. go out and blow it. So they don't have that. It's probably foundation. so good that you went through that because yeah. who knows how you would have handled it had you not. Well, to that. put, it, even, well, I wouldn't have gotten there without that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. Well, even to take take it even further, you now have the means to buy whatever drug you want. You have the means to you know to 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 uh, to do to abuse yourself in ways that you couldn't do before and this is a challenge that a lot of people it is run alcohol into. was my problem uh this time before it was always something else but alcohol was, was legal mm-hmm. uh and so forth it, it was got, like a step above it's not illegal but still yeah. caused problems right yeah it's still a bad thing mm-hmm. uh for me you know i i don't get to have to i don't get to drink a few drinks that's mm-hmm. not how it works for me so, um, like everybody else has a little fun, that's fine, you know, and I can hang out with people that are drinking, it's not a problem. But I have to avoid it. I have, I have this thing, it's, I'm gonna write a song about it, it's called The Power of No. And it's just, you just say no every time. Um, Nancy Reagan said it best. <laughs> <laughs> say no. Uh, so, but anyway, I, I just love, um, you know, not drinking. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, I was so bad that I was sick, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, but I, I also got into trouble uh, drinking. And because I have a mental issue, I didn't realize that if, I, if, I, if I'm if i not balanced and the wrong, the wrong kinds of things are happening in my life, the wrong stressors and such, I can go crazy. I can go nuts. I can be manic. Uh, it's been a long time. But mm-hmm. because of that, you know the story, right? 2013, the cops, uh, I ran into three cop cars in one one sitting. Whoa, wait, wait, hold on. What happened? You, you literally ran into? Yeah, but it, I mean, the story is so weird. It's hard to know what really happened, but I was just trying to go home. I wasn't drinking, but I had a, me- I had a mental um, breakdown. And it was a bad time to have a mental breakdown right there with all those cops around me. <laughs> it's just not it. So I'm still. It's 2013. I'm still on um, mental um, observation from the state, mm-hmm. and it keeps me from doing certain things. Uh, did did you did you de- I mean, did you develop a spiritual practice as a result of this? Did, did that end up moving you in that direction? Because it seems. I mean, yes. It's it's a radical right. shift. It's right. in, it's incredible to hear. To me, it's uh, it is spiritual, but spiritual to me is doesn't require any kind of do- any kind of uh, training in scriptures or training and or belief that there's a certain thing. It's more for me. It's a higher power. It, it, there's obviously something going on, you know. But because that humility again kind of mm-hmm. comes in handy because it, it always tells me. Well, you're not an atheist and you're not really an agnostic because you're really a believer. You just don't know what it is you're believing in. Mm. It's just that everybody's got an idea of what or who or how God is. Mine is mine. And it's very, it's vague enough to where I can't, I can't explain it, but I can definitely say that I believe in it and it makes a difference in my life. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and, and so now how's the business doing? 
they're making my bread. It's not even my bread anymore. In uh, Canada and Mexico. I don't know. I can't keep up with the whole story with what's going I, on. I can't. I never, I never don't see your bread. It's always everywhere yeah, I go, I see it. Well, you remember, I mean, I can tell you, in, my, in the old days, my wife now, but she was my girlfriend then, we used to go from store to store to store to store to store to store because nobody would take care of the bread. Nobody it was like, what? Especially up in Seattle when we first got up there, these, these, Fred Meyer, you guys don't know what Fred Meyer is, but uh, Fred Meyer store had the nutrition center. These managers would not, uh, they didn't want nothing to do with it. They're like, well, we're not touching this stuff. Nobody cares about this crap. Mm. You know, I was walking in hearing that, you know, mm. literally. Mm. And <laughs> I'm already, I'm knowing that we're, we're in a new area, but the point is uh, there was a lot of struggles. I, the struggles of a business, you know, I don't know if I'd have been ready for some of those struggles without the struggles I had before. Right, right. You know, those things that led to everything. It's one thing after another. It's not perfectly linear. It didn't happen just the way it should have in every instance. But everything that happened before matters. Yeah. Do you remember um, how much revenue the business was doing when you first got involved and then where it was at its peak? And then you also mentioned it's no longer your bread, so I'm assuming you sold. Yeah. So... Do you remember those? It was about, my brother had built the business as a Trader Joe's, basically a Trader Joe's uh, supplier. But he had also had his own brands that weren't really doing all that great. They were, you know, France. Some of the bigger companies were, were really just smashing them down. So it was like, I don't want to uh, give a number because I don't know. I, I can't remember the number anymore, but it's in the one to two million dollar range. Okay, that's right. approximately. I, that's about where it was. Yeah, and then when we sold it, uh, we sold the first part. I sold uh, my brother sold completely out. My nephew and I sold half of our interest, and uh, or something like that. At the time, that was we each got like four million or something important after taxes, and then it was like. Then, then we were still part of the company, um, but less and less control. And I was seeing things change, and it was getting really, it was getting tough for me because uh -huh. it was personal. But we, the second time we sold with the private equity, who was half owners of the business, we sold for two hundred seventy-five million. Holy shit! Yeah. Wow. Now, when you saw that much money, were you like, what? I didn't see that 275. But, <laughs> no, but when I saw that we were going to sell for 275, yeah. well, you know, for me, it was like this huge relief because at this point, I knew we were, I knew we were successful, but I didn't know, um, but I, I was afraid. It was a, I was actually feeling, you know, you guys, no business, SWAT, the SWAT thing where you go it's strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats i could see all of them you know what i mean and the threats were threats were one there were you couldn't see what the threats were you mm -hmm. just knew they were there there's lots of things going a lot of workings and that's what i was worried about but once it once we sold it i'm like okay it's off my chest mm -hmm. but it also was sucky for if you love what you do yeah i was just oh, gonna it's your say baby yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you end up replacing it with something else so that you could continue <laughs> yeah. to have that that purpose or that you know, right that day to day yeah i i suggest uh anybody who's listening to this wants to know what i do now go to my instagram or go to my davedoll360.com and um it, it's not updated right now but my instagram shows what i do now which is this crazy another crazy thing i uh, collect african masks Oh, wow. That's really Random. different. Than yeah. Random. <laughs> where, where did that come from? Yeah. Well, it's again, I'm sort of an artist, right? But not, I would. I don't make a living as an artist. You know, I, I, I apply art and I apply science to mm. what I did in the bakery, right? But uh, now, uh, I just love art. I love stuff. It's like, but I get obsessed. It's like if I had gotten into doing cameras, you know, these would be really cool, right? I'd be like, those are part of my collection, you know? Yeah. Or whatever those are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, instead, when I made some money, when I actually was no longer in the business and I had to fill my time up, uh, yeah. Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, those. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and those are all antique African art used in ceremonies and such. 
Hopefully you don't got $4 million worth, right? You didn't buy $4 million worth uh, of art, did you? I probably a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got all a in. lot more than $4 million the second time. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. the second time was a lot better than the first Still, my wife is like, you know, uh, it, it, you actually can go broke still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's that one? What's that one celebrity? What's his name? Uh, he 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 went bankrupt because he bought like a he bought like like a dinosaur egg and like a like what? This, oh, and, 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 and like a, a skull of a you know. It's just like what's his name. He was a national uh, where he tried to steal the Constitution. Oh, Isn't yeah, that? Nicholas Cage. Nicholas yeah. Cage, dude. I remember reading that, yeah. too. Oh, oh, like, oh and, this guy. Is, but and nobody wants the egg, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So is this where, I mean, is, is this where you do spend your money? Are you into art like that? And that's where, if you were to say, okay, if I enjoy myself or enjoy my money, is that how you, because I, I actually kind of expect you to roll in here with, like, the Rolex watch and then some fancy yeah. gator shoes and maybe yeah. so, like, <laughs> that's what, I was like, what shoes are not going to hurt my <laughs> I got this wart on my that's been there for like two years. <laughs> oh, no. And it hurts every step I You're take. Like, I ain't taking put no gators uh, on that thing. Yeah. So I'm like, that's what matters to me right now. Not hurting. Yeah. And uh so anyway and I'm not I'm not fancy yeah so what do you spend your if you're gonna spend money where do you spend money obviously on uh, the art on the art yeah you know family it costs money um you have kids we have a lot of property okay we, do you have any kids I have two daughters, three granddaughters. Oh, yeah. good for you. Yeah, right? wonderful. They've turned out great. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> and then we got, uh, I, my, my wife has uh, four sons, and um, it's hard to keep up with all the kids that are popping, you know? Uh, got another one on the way right now. Oh, uh, congratulations. Wow. Yeah. Are the properties family. investment properties? Or are they properties you travel to? Like, what, how Some do you are investment properties. Uh, some are, uh, like I have a penthouse right now I'm trying to get rid of. It's like I lived in this penthouse for, while well, I was split up with my wife. We weren't married yet, but I was a kind of a bachelor for a couple of years and I lived downtown in this penthouse. On the top floor, 27th floor of, of you know, of a building down there. And, uh, when when we got married, she didn't bother to tell me ahead of time that she didn't want to live there anymore. <laughs> she, <laughs> she waited. Right. Yeah, he <laughs> signed that paper. Mm -hmm. She was kind of right though. Uh, so what we're doing is we have this property, twenty seven. It's thirty two acres now, uh, ranch farm uh, on the river, and we've always loved the land. But now we got to build the prop, build the house. Uh, okay. So that's what that's kind of another thing that I'm spending time and definitely money. You gonna on. build a gym in there? Oh yeah, and yeah. are you going to use some of your drafting Maybe. skills? So What's use that? some of your drafting skills to uh, actually draw it up. I've actually this no. is this is a dream of mine is actually to draw my own oh, house. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I oh. actually liked our architecture. Well, I would jump if I was you. I'd be all over learning CAD the way it is now, because the CAD uh, is a lot less, a lot more user friendly. Oh more, yeah, you know, it's, oh, okay. You, there's a lot of things that are already drawn. You just pop them into place. You know, oh, wow. you, and then you can modify them the way. What oh, you want. cool. Solid modeling is, well, when I left back in early 2000s, solid modeling was was the thing because you draw, I draw this can and I stretch it and <laughs> make it bigger. Oh, and, I see. Yeah. It's a lot of fun, man, I'm telling you. And um, so I think the, they took all the fun of it now, be, out of it now because everybody's already done that. So the gym, you going to make a sick gym yeah. in there? I looked at your gym and I was like, okay. I'll probably have a few more machines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, this, this I is love all, the size of it. No, no, this is all for filming. We didn't build our dream. If we built oh. our dream gym, it would be 10 times the yeah, size. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. I'm, I'm not... I'm definitely not down in it. Although you would, <laughs> although you would appreciate these racks that we have in here. These racks are cool. They fold away completely, so they're really nice. Like squat racks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. nice. They're really stable. Yeah. So, let you jump on them before we leave. Yeah, I'd like to see. <laughs> no, I ain't doing no workout. Today. <laughs> I didn't come ready to work out, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's cool, dude. Yeah. Um, I will definitely have the dream dream uh, gym. Yeah, hell yeah, and a dream place for my art. They're doing it right because uh, currently I have this uh, long showroom in my warehouse that I built I, that I had built um, and if you see that place you'd be like wow what the hell because it's, it's extreme this is as extreme as it gets as far as taking up space so what I want to do is take the best ones move them around Move them around uh, in the new place. Always constantly be moving them around because that's what I love to mm. do, and and make them a little less uh, less tight. Mm. 
if somebody's listening right now, if there's a kid listening right now who's uh, maybe going on the wrong path, you have do you have any messages for them? It's tough with the kids because you know because they don't want to listen. That, yeah, because they're not going to hear some of the stuff that I need to want to tell them, which is look at what kid don't want to hear about humility. Kid doesn't want to hear about uh, you know not getting what you want right now. We're getting it down the road, but that's. I've spoken to thousands of people, sometimes a, a hundred here, a thousand like kids in a high school. The, the high school ones tend to be somewhat receptive. Mm -hmm. There's some of them, the ones that already have their head on their shoulders, they can just use a little inspiration. The ones that are on the struggling path, I hope I give them hope. You know, like, okay, this guy, because I that's when I really pull out the warts. Yeah, <laughs> because they need to hear, they need to know how bad things were before they got good. And that if it, if I can do it, you know, you're not going to make killer bread, but you're going to do something, you know, and you're going to find something meaningful in your life. And that's, that's what I like to, uh, I like to figure out ways to instill that in the kids. And so to that end, I, I actually created videos and stuff that I would show at my, um, at my appearances, if yeah. you will. Oh, that'd be cool to get a hold of one of those. Yeah, I would yeah. Like... Well, they're right there. <laughs> oh, cool. Go on my YouTube page. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, yeah. We'll, well, we'll rip one of those I'd, off. There. I'd love to come to your gym when you're done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll come out there and do well, a workout. Film you, you promise? Sure. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we, hey, if somebody invites us to a cool gym, we're oh, going. Yeah. Yeah. you guys got to film it. And, like, you yeah. know, we'll do the whole thing. We're visiting right? Dave. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. man, that's a great Dave. idea. I love that, guys. I would love that. Oh, that's 100%, yeah. man. Be, very... well, you guys have become like a, a mainstay for me now um, since I found out who you were. <laughs> I started, you know, because there's so much good information. You guys are, you just tell it like it is. and uh, I mean, you don't fight. I'm surprised. <laughs> we do, <laughs> we do when the cameras are off. Yeah, we do when the yeah. cameras are off. We do when the cameras yeah. are off. Yeah. We're just like any other, we're, we're like any other business. I, you know, you, you said something, though, that's really interesting. Yeah, we we talk a lot about... Um, you know, we, we've built this, there's, there's three separate entities. We've, we've built it in a way and we structured it in a way that we may sell one day. And it's a conversation off air that we talk about that, you know, maybe we want to spend more time with our families and less work and, and, and cash out. Right. Yeah. Um, or maybe sell part of it and still be a part. One of our biggest fears is, is, you know, would we be able to handle somebody having control yeah. and kind of telling us how things are going to be when it's our baby? You know, we, we, we grew it, we raised it, took it, scaled it to where it's at. Yeah. Um, it depends on what you're, what your really all your goals are because you know it could be that you you want it that way and you just want to rake in the money yeah at that point uh or it could be that if but you remember from my from my story just remember the fact that you can be re very regretful about selling yeah and not doing it the way you should have yeah. sure. another thing you said too is uh about you and your nephew being at each other's throats but you had the common goal yeah and uh, I mean, we we mm -hmm. we argue and fight all the time. But the thing that trumps all that is the common goal, yeah. and so it doesn't matter. And that makes a big we difference. Otherwise, win. yeah. Otherwise, the fighting t is is more important. But it's not. It's the well, goal. Did you, did you guys ever develop a vision and mission statement? Hundred percent. Okay. That's, yeah. that's well, what the other thing that's important that goes in line with what you said too is the humility, right? So we're all in our forties, and so we've we've gone through. The, if we were in our twenties, not so humble. Probably would have tore each other's faces off. Yeah. Right, right. But where we're at now, everybody is. We all understand that there is a common goal. That so even when we're going back and forth, no one ever gets that mad at each other because they, it's not about them. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about yeah. winning and we're both trying to win and so we recognize that even the frustration that's going back and forth is with the same desired outcome of of winning and doing well so well so you're much, way more mature than we were but uh, <laughs> but i mean we we did <clears throat> because we survived um our own worst uh you know tendencies i guess to, to as we were together you know, because of that vision and mission statement mm -hmm. that we finally, we didn't know what the hell that meant. My dad didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, all these years, nobody, well, vision and mission, they was, that's voodoo. <laughs> that's what my, my brother would say. And then I'd be like, but, but when we figured it out, we got some help actually to figure it out that we needed to backtrack and go get some foundation here, something that we can use as a blueprint in a sense so that we don't kill each other. Because we really were in bad 
bad <laughs> shape. Yeah. You made it though. Well, you I did, love you. I love your story, man. It's it's incredibly inspiring and it's empowering. I think more people need to hear stories like this, uh, especially in today's climate. Uh, you know, to um, you know, have that redemptive uh, side of, of things. Like you can come back. There's, a There's too many story victims. To That's right. Too many victims. Too many victims. In this victims. World. If you have a victim mentality, victim stance, you're not going nowhere. No. Um, no. You know, you might be able to get the government to give you something. But right. yeah. <laughs> well, not. it's it's um, it's confusing empathy with uh, with being a victim. You can look, I can hear your story and say, man, that sucks. They went through some hard shit. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, uh, the only person that can really change things is you. And so you once you, you realize that once you realize powerful. that, and it's a really hard thing to do because then you have to also accept that you're the, that all the problems you had were also because of you. So you got to accept both yep. and move forward. It's a real tough. So hearing you is inspiring because it's about as authentic as it gets. Like there's not a single word come out of your mouth. That's not. It's just what it is. Honest. Yeah. 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 So. I don't have to make up. Any, I don't have to remember any of my lies. Cause I don't tell lies. <laughs> it's a good place to Except be. to my wife. Hey, hey. Yeah. We'll cut that out. Don't <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get him in no, trouble. She'll think that's funny. Yeah. I think she'll think that's funny. That's good, man. Right. Awesome. Well, I appreciate well you coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank hey, you and thanks for listening to our show that makes me really happy that you yeah, like yeah. our show well, yeah, it's a good show yeah yeah appreciate, appreciate you man awesome. thank I you i wish you all the success same thank you, thank you.